Welcome to Data Points, Ideas on Data, Law, and Society. This lecture is brought to you by the Program on Data and Governance, a program of the Moritz College of Law and the Translational Data Analytics Institute, and is presented with generous support from Porter Wright. Join me in welcoming Valentin Godard, member of the Advisory Council on Artificial Intelligence of Canada, United Nations AI and Data Policy and Governance Expert, Founder and Executive Director of AI Impact Alliance. She will be presenting Art in AI, Artists at the Crossroads of Cultural, Social and Technological Change. Thank you for being with us today. Our program will begin shortly. Member of the Trans Relational Data Analytics Institute here at The Ohio State University. Back in 2016, the Moritz College of Law and the Translational Data Analytics Institute, we call it TDAI, uh, decided to create a new program on the governance of advanced analytics and AI. And I was lucky enough to be named the faculty director. We call that program the Program on Data and Governance, or for short, PDG. Um, PDG focuses on the governance of advanced analytics and AI, and it has a three-part mission. It, it does this in three ways. First of all, it conducts research on how to maximize the benefits and reduce the threats from advanced analytics and AI. Second, it provides nonpartisan research-based advice to governments and organizations in the private sector on how to develop and implement AI responsibly and in a way that is consistent with our social values. And finally, it engages our community in an ongoing conversation about the role of AI, its impact on our society, and how we can govern it so that it does enable us to live the lives we want to lead, enable us to flourish, and not undermine our ability to do so. And we try to facilitate this conversation in a number of ways, including, and importantly, through this Data Points lecture series. Um, and we have three Data Points lectures each year. Uh, this is our third of this academic year. Now, we couldn't do any of this without our partners and supporters. And for the Data Points Lecture Series, our partner and supporter is the law firm of Porter Wright, Morris, and Arthur. They've been supporting us in this for a number of years. Um, and we thank them for understanding the importance of these issues, the importance of advanced analytics and AI, and the need to govern them intelligently and well. We also could not do this without our PDG staff, and in particular, our program manager, uh, Angie Westover Munoz, who is really responsible for putting this event on today and has done such a good job with it. Um, thank you, Angie. Now, like I said, our PDG has been working on the governance of advanced analytics and AI since early, since the beginning of January uh, of 2016. And at that time, our focus was on predictive AI, the use of AI to analyze data about the past in order to predict the future. And that was the primary way that we saw AI being implemented and rolled out in our society. But on November 30th, 2022, that changed when OpenAI released to the public ChatGPT, ushering in the era of generative AI. The use of AI not just to make predictions based on past content, but to generate new content. Now that 
opened up a whole new world of possibilities for AI, the emergence of generative AI, and it opened up a whole new world of possibilities for many of us because it, it allowed each of us sitting at our computers to participate in and get some of the, the benefits and insights of AI. But it also created important new issues and threats. Some of these concern human content creators, such as artists, or maybe even law professors. Um, generative AI may train on and learn from and imitate artists' work. Do the generative AI developers like OpenAI or Microsoft or Google or Meta owe these content creators compensation for using their work in this way? What if the new content imitates that of the human content creators, like imitates somebody's art style? Is that a violation of their intellectual property? What if an artist uses an AI-generated product, a human artist uses an AI-generated product in their art? Do they have an intellectual property, the human have an intellectual property interest in that ultimate creation? These are pressing issues today that the emergence of generative AI has thrust upon us, among other issues that it has raised. Artists also have another role to play in our relationship with and reaction to and adaptation to AI. Um, generative and predictive AI are changing our society. They're changing our world. They're changing us. And we need to think about that. How are they changing us? How are they changing our society? And how do we want them to affect us? And artists have always helped us to understand the changes in the world around us and the changes in ourselves and, they are, and to react to those changes. And artists are doing that today in engaging with um, the relationship between us and these machines that are now so present in our lives. So art and artists have a real stake in this field of AI governance. And we wanted to include in our data point series someone who thinks deeply about the connection between art and AI and could speak to the interactions between them and bring that to our ongoing community conversation about the governance of advanced analytics and AI. And our speaker today is very well suited to that task. Valentin Goddard is both a lawyer and an arts curator and a globally recognized expert on AI. She's a member of the Advisory Council on AI of Canada. She's a United Nations expert on AI policy and governance and a Mozilla Creative Media awardee. And we're very fortunate indeed to have uh, Valentine here today to share her ideas on the interactions between AI and art. So a couple of words about our format. Um, Valentine Goddard will speak and then we will have Q&A with the audience. Uh, if you're here in person, you can raise your hand. We've got a microphone, we'll bring it around to you and you can ask your question. If you're online, there is a Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, a Q&A button. Uh, just click on that. You can do it any time during the presentation, put your question in. I will be reading those and relaying those questions or as many of them as I can um, to our speaker. So that's how we're gonna to operate today. Um, and without further ado, I will turn this over to Valentin Goddard. One. Now everybody can hear me. How many artists do we have in the room? Ooh, four, five, six. Wonderful. Policy people. Law. 
Okay, business MBAs, engineering, AI, tech. Wow, we have a beautifully mixed room. I'm really, really happy and very honored to have been invited and be here with you today. So the, oh, going back, over there. We're ready to go, rock and roll. Okay, this is going to be a controversial conversation. You are getting a sneak peek into an art exhibit that I have not launched yet. So you're really the first ones to get a little sneak peek into it. It's going to be launched officially March 8th. Uh, so for Women's Day, Women's International uh, Rights Day. There used to be Women's Day, now it's Women's International Rights Day. It will be launched soon. And the conversation is around art, AI, and policy and the policy implications of those two meeting together. So the exhibit will be called Algorithmic Frontiers. And now I have to point the other way, sorry. Or maybe not. So the first thing I wanted to discuss is art in itself has been recognized as an institution. Art is people. Art has an important role to play in society. AI is coming to disrupt that role, and that's what we will be de discussing at different legal, economic, and political uh, level. This is the sneak peek into the exhibit. These are 12 pieces that I've um, created. Some of them are AI created, some of them are not. Um, and that's part of the conversation. And some of them are partly created using AI, and that's also part of the conversation. And during the interactive exhibit, when it's launched, algorithmfrontiers.com, you'll be able to click on each one of the paintings and understand how it was made and what the different implications are. I swear it's the equivalent of a book. The content in here is 17 pages long, and all the links, if you add them, are their policy briefs that I presented at the UN, uh, presented to different uh, governments, provincial, federal level. And so it really broadens the conversation at, to, at different levels. The QR code here is AI generated. Uh, it links to a petition, which is really bringing a community together around putting artists center and front to that conversation on generative AI governance and regulation. There's about 2,000, there's over 2,000 signatories to that petition. For Canada, that's a lot. Um, and it's the, actually we mapped who's signing and there's a, an interesting level of support here in the States as well, as well as internationally who are joining the, uh, the signatories of that petition. So I put the little sparkly there because I think it's a very glossy conversation to do art and AI. I also think it's becoming rather polarized. Is it okay? Is it not okay? And I hope that today's discussion brings it beyond that level of polarization and really helps us have a constructive discussion about what we can do forward. So I think the first question to ask is, Who's making, and I'm gonna, I, I, I really hesitate to use the word generated art or AI art. That in itself has become a subject of conversation. Um, so when I speak, I'm trying to be very specific about generative AI, generated art or generated images, or uh, so you might hear that kind of language more throughout the conversation. So who is designing those platforms? Who owns those platforms? What are the business models that control those platforms is important to, to ask in, in that relationship between AI and art. Are those, as an artist, so I'm a lawyer, I'm an artist, I'm a curator, I'm an AI policy person. So I put my artist hat on. Are these platforms helping me tell my story as a, as a woman. I grew up um, in a small town, very poor. People around me really didn't have working class or welfare, not a lot of money. 
um, are these platforms helping the fishermen? It was a fishing town. So is, is the, are these technologies helping a, a variety of people? Um, I have very uh, close ties to the LGBTQ community. Are they helping tell those stories? I have very close friends who, have, who are people of color. Are their stories easy to tell? When I try to draw my friend, who's a black woman, am I able to draw her and use those platforms without her skin being whitened every time I use a generative function, a variation function? So that's kind of the story. Are we better heard through those tools or are we silenced through those tools? So who's making the AI platforms? Couple statistics. 80%, and this is, these are really general averages because you know it's Canada, US, and different countries, but 80% or more of AI professors are men. Uh, I know the AI Institute in Montreal, which is a really important and big one, Mila, uh, there's about 350 professors. I would say it's more like one or 2% that are female. 15% uh, of AI research staff at Facebook, 10% at Google are women. 22% of AI professionals globally are women. Black workers make up 9% of STEM workers. We bring that to AI, I don't know, it's like 0 0.5, 0 0.1. One in five global tech startups include a female founder. So even when you go from business to research to academia, there's a, a situation of minority. More stats. Um, generally speaking, when you look at the impact of AI on women or women who are in AI, are they being, are they helped or not? Are they advanced or not? We're actually seeing uh, increased violence due to the, the use of AI against women on social uh, media. The targeting is easier and uh, there's an increase of violence that uh, translate into real world uh, violence. Uh, there are more women who are being affect who are affected by the digital gap, have less access to the tools to be able to use AI, collect data, generate design their own algorithms, do what they want to do with AI and take part actively of that process. These are all backed by a number of research that you can look at the uh, uh, International Labor Organization, at IMF, uh, uh, McKinsey, for example, there's a number of reports that highlight these. Um, women are more at risk of job loss from AI uh, facilitated automation. Um, women in that, the research I found in Canada, women in AI are less paid than men. So even when you are working in AI, if you are an AI tech startup, as a female, you make less money and there's less financial benefit. This is really, and if you look at uh, black racialized indigenous LGBTQ community, you multiply this times times two. So um, sorry for the bleak <laughs> overall presentation, but uh, we have to be aware that these tools are not neutral. They are designed and created by a group of people who might be very well intentioned, but personally, I, I find that as a woman, for example, who started doing this work in 2017 and advocating for more access to the tools for different communities, that change has not happened so rapidly. This, and now Sora, OpenAI Sora has been released and we can now generate crazy videos extremely fast. So the policy is not advancing as fast and the reduction of bias in those tools is not advancing as fast as the technical developments. And that's a problem. So story, going back to stories, are they helping me tell my story as an artist? Stories are our power that will determine kind of news, movies, it's our culture, it's how we express ourselves, it's how we feel comfortable in the environment that we're in. They're extremely important. Um, just to go back very quickly at a quick overview of what we can do with AI and art, who's played around with DALI? Quick show of hands. Not so many, I'm surprised. Okay, you have to try it. <laughs> um, at least have fun, go try, see what it does and test out the words. There's a really, really interesting research that came out uh, done by 
um, I'll get back to that one um, after, but it's really worth trying because you'll see if it's telling your story, you'll see if how impressed you are by different results. It's really technically quite impressive. OpenAI SOAR is not yet available to, who knows what OpenAI SOAR is? Okay, OpenAI SOAR is OpenAI's new deli. So instead of being text to image, prompting with words and getting an image result, it is text to video. So I want a picture of a, a dog walking from windowsill to windowsill, and then you see the dog walking from window to window. Um, it, it, it's very impressive. Um, people still jog on the wrong way on the treadmill, so it still doesn't understand basic physics, but um, it is quite um, impressive. Uh, the first movie entirely AI generated uh, who received copyright a couple of weeks ago. So in January 2024, fully AI generated film received copyright, registered copyright in South Korea this January. Um, full AI generated comedy was done in the States um, this year using a uh, deceased, a dead comedian's voice, uh, comedy style. They generated a full comedy. Um, I forget his name, Carlin. I forget his first name. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so um, now his uh, daughter is uh, suing for lack of consent in, and that's going to be a very interesting one for the legal students in the class to follow because usually artists' moral rights don't follow to the next, uh, to the, the the family, to the estate. Um, but sh I, I'm not sure what uh, are the basis of. Her, her lawsuit, but that's going to be very interesting to, to follow. And that's what lawyers are talking about now who work in the AI space are, do we need to start integrating in our wills um, uh, some uh, elements that refer to our image rights, our voice rights, um, models are being 3D scanned. So young models who go into work right now, most of them are signing away 3D modeling of their body, of them walking and they don't even know what that's being used for. So these are all emerging uh, regulatory questions in that sector. Um, also, just globally looking at what the profit is. So who stands to profit? So this is a McKenzie study. The uh, low hanging fruit, so who's really looking at increased, increased profit um, is military uses of generative AI, uh, high tech, of course, banking, Pharmaceutical life sciences in, in general um, seek to be able to, they have the lowest hanging fruit. They have the most to win from the adoption of those technologies. Um, Department of Defense here in the States has launched um, a research group on generative AI applications within the military. <clears throat> So we're, again, we're trying to look at who's in art, what is art doing, who's AI, who's making AI systems, who will profit from AI systems, and what's at the junction of those two. So who works in the arts and cultural field? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah no, I mean, show my hands. I like, statistically, so who, what, are there more women, more men? Who, who works in the arts and cultural sector in the States? Anyone? No? OK, I'll give Canadian statistics. Um, in Canada, visual artists, there's a majority over 56%, it varies, um, of visual artists are female. Uh, indigenous artists in Canada are visual artists. And visual artists are the first ones to face loss of income. Illustrators are losing already facing concept artists are facing loss of income. So who faces loss of income due to generative AI versus who gains, who has to gain from it is an important question and that power relationship between the two that's important to ask um, ourselves. Um, so the having a sectoral and gendered analysis of the deployment of generative AI in the arts and culture sector is one of the recommendations that I put forward. I'm not coming today with a tons of answers. I'm just saying it's an important question to ask ourselves. 
Okay. I'm guessing, was this generated? Yes, yes, no. Yes. Yes, okay. Right answer. Um, these are generated variations of what a selkie is. So the first image you saw in uh, my art exhibit is um, a selkie. A selkie is a traditional seal slash woman character. And when I showed uh, some collaborators the exhibit and the character and the art piece that I made, first question is, hey, is that Sedna? Is it, um, I'm not sure I know who Sedna is. Well, Sedna is the Inuit sea goddess, goddess of the sea, of the underworld. And it's like, oh, well, that's interesting. I never thought of that. And then when I show you later on the process through which I've created my character, you'll see that sometimes, even if you start creating something as an artist, you need, you use a variation, you're not always in control of what is coming into your art piece. And so I went and had these fully generated pieces of different cultures uh, on purpose. Um, risk, this, this would definitely fall into the category of uh, cultural appropriation. So this is, I'm doing the, I put the warning there on purpose not to be used, sold on t-shirts. Um, but I thought it was very interesting and important to, to talk about those risks that you can go in and ask for uh, Mamiwata, is the African sea goddess. Uh, at the top, I asked who is Sedna, draw me an indigenous traditional drawing of Sedna, and it did. And at the bottom is uh, Ningyo, so it's a Japanese uh, a sea um, fish woman character. Um, I also find it very interesting that it brings up very stereotypical images of those characters, not imaginative. They all look a bit Walt Disney-ish. Uh, the Japanese character, you almost see her breast. She's like, why is the kimono falling off her, her shoulder? Because when you look at the traditional images, that's not the case. So they're kind of sexualized in, in a way. Um, also, I don't know if you noticed, but the black woman has blue eyes. That is something that happens, I'm not saying it happens in real life too, of course, but in AI systems, when you go from, uh, let's say, inputting a beautiful painting of uh, Michelle Obama, after generation one, her skins get lighter. After generation three, four, her eyes become blue. Of course, in the meantime, her boobs are getting bigger and she, <laughs> her clothes is changing. Um, but if you add the word leader, uh, she becomes white, man with blue eyes. So that tendency is very present. Okay, so again, we're going back to our question. Is generative AI helping everybody tell their story better or not? Um, I wanted to talk about, you know, I've never tried this before. Ah, okay. So I have time. I think it's really interesting. Who wants to see a short making of video of the original Selkie to the generated Selkie, who's then animated Selkie? Yes. Okay. So we're going to switch over to pause and we're going to go to my Vimeo page. It should be there. Okay. And then. They're going to go to sulky process and then I just want to lower the volume because it might be annoying for people online. Volume. Skip. And then lower the volume so nobody hears that. Okay. And then we can play. Play. And everybody sees this online too? I'll make it happen. Okay. So I turned off the volume so I can narrow, narrate it as soon as we see it. Okay, so this is the first drawing that, that I did. Is it, it's, okay, I'm just gonna go by the way. I'm gonna control it from here. So this is the uh, first drawing that I made. Okay, it's graphite, it's paper. There's a slight layer of watercolor. Um, it's inspired by the initial goal of this exhibit. It's a project that started uh, February, 2020. Um, so for Valentine's Day, I don't know, maybe I was having a glass of wine or something in front of the computer 
and I put Women, Beauty, and Perfection. And text to image technology at the time, quite abstract, and it generated a pair. I was like, why does Women, Beauty, and Perfection do a pair? Uh, that's interesting, just the pair as a concept. So my husband is a, a, a AI expert and said, okay, I want, we need to sit down and really identify the causes of this. So that's our geeky Valentine's Day, February 2020. Uh, the year after we launched an app and that app um, helped collect, um, we asked women from across the world to give us nine words because that's how natural language processing works. So we asked it to give us more words so we can retrain text to image and see how much of an impact we can have on the images that are generated in the output. Can, how, how do you gain control on the output, on the generated images? We have, uh, so the pair AI.art is an application. You can go, you can add words now if you want to. It's still ongoing. We'll do other art projects with it. Um, and inspired by those words, it was very interesting because I found that when we asked them, um, it was give us three words for women and gender in general, beauty and imperfection. A lot of words around imperfection had to do with beauty and vice versa. It was very interesting. So that drawing is my human inspiration. She looks like my mom. Uh, it's my, it, it comes from me, right? That's what artists do. You express yourself. Okay. Then this is a digital layer of watercolor. So you can see she's starting to change. And this is Dali. These are Dali variations. Um, so I have very little control and it was more like a sculpture, uh, a little bit of still of a watercolor feel, but I thought it was very interesting. And I chose this one. This was my favorite and I chose her. She became my Selkie that, um, I then, uh, I, I corrected her eye. She had an eye missing and then I used, um, digital drawing painting tools. Uh, to modify or change or animate um, and paint over it. Um, I've moved the eyes, the animations that they're in the, uh, in the application are through this. I've painted over her. I also use the words that you were contributed by uh, women from over 40 countries. I just wrote them on, on her and, and was inspired by that for the, uh, for the exhibit. slow part so here you see you can have yeah there's many layers so we go from my original drawing to doing one level of generative variation there's only once that i used generative ai dali technology throughout the whole process in the creation of the selkie now i'd love to know in the room who thinks this is AI art or who thinks this is analog art from a legal perspective. Do I have copyright over this image? Yes or no? People who think yes. People who think no. All okay. right. There are other pictures in the exhibit that would lead to a much more heated debate. Because this one, I really emphasize the role that I had in the creative process. But remember, I said when I did that one level variation, I had two people react in my environment, collaborators, who said, hey, is that Sedna? Is that cultural appropriation? Because, oh, well, you have to be aware as an artist, because in that one level variation, you have no idea what you're picking up from their model. So... <laughs> I, I personally would, um, again, we can just put it back on the, on the presentation. Also, I think it, what's important in this process is I put layers of watercolor. I put darker layers of watercolor. And when I put it into the video generator, so Runway ML has a free text to video generator or image plus text video generator. So you can put, uh, so women, in, older women are also very invisible. If I put wrinkles on a, on a, 
on a woman on purpose and really draw them out or smile and cringe at the picture and try to get variations that keep the wrinkles? No, it, they just go away. There's like the smiley, happy, happy, happy wrinkles. Uh, they, they get washed out, right? So in that process of drawing, you get an, a, a variation. This Selkie, if you go, when the uh, exhibit is released, she gets in the video generations undressed. She, they will generate her. She ends up in a white, small bra. She ends up white. She ends up um, very, always very different than how I would like her to be generated. So it's a lot of effort to be able to tell my story. It's part of my research. I'm enjoying it. Don't worry. I'm not complaining. <laughs> but I think it's important to understand that it doesn't help everybody um, express themselves in the same way. I just want to go back to the other image that was in here. No. Yeah, thanks. Okay. The other thing that you'll find, so is AI, generative AI a tool for artists? Again, I want to bring back because the conversation is about putting artists in control of that technology, is in the exhibit, uh, I, we trained what is called a RAG. A RAG is a uh, retrieval augmented generative system. So you put that on top of a foundational model. Foundational model could be um, GPT-4, so OpenAI's model, for example, and you can train your own RAG on top of that model on your images, your text. So I do policy and um, I input the policy work that I do so people can chat with the exhibit and right away explore the policy implications through that chatbot. Um, so that was trained with our, our, our uh, and that's my dog when he's a puppy. <laughs> so this is an interesting tool because artists can create their own cultural mediator to express themselves. So this is a really interesting use of a chatbot on which you have more control on the input and express yourself. So as an artist, I've also been on the board of um, uh, museum in Montreal, Montreal Museum of Fine Art. So I know the kind of questions they ask themselves. I know the volunteer cultural meters and the tour guides. And this is kind of an additional tool that can be useful for museums, but also just from the artists or artist collectives point of view to tell their story. This is a way that you can intervene in the process to do that. Okay, so I was talking about the fact that it is I felt that it was harder for me, and I hear a lot of enthusiasm from certain people in the creative industry and less enthusiasm from other people in the creative industry. And I find that there's a gendered um, react polarization in, in that reaction. It's the people who are excited don't seem to care or understand that the bias is important. Bias in these generative AI systems is extremely important because it's how we tell our stories. Are we being silenced? Are we allowed to express ourselves better? And I wanted to emphasize and bring to your attention this um, report that was done by Bloomberg and released um, maybe three weeks ago. And people often say, yeah, but it just reflects bias that exists in society. Okay, it was a show of hands. How many people think the bias that we find in AI is just reflective of what we have in society. Okay, how many people think it make it, Genevieve can make it better? Worse? Okay, it makes it worse. Yeah, okay, I've got the answer on the word. Anyway, <laughs> um, it showed that, for example, dishwasher, they had more dark skinned people being generated. When you ask it, generate me a, a dishwasher, when actually in real life, there's more white people washing dishes. Uh, there's more dark people generated in prison compared to what there are actually in real jail, jails. There's a lot more white male CEOs. Um, and so if, you, if you read that, that report, it's amazing. It goes through all the details for gender, people of color, 
and how it generates more bias than we have in society. So when we talk about generative AI as a tool to tell our stories, our stories are about to get very distorted. And who's read the news <laughs> this week? I think while I was on the plane yesterday, something again happened, and there's this huge debate right now that is related to our conversation. Google Gemini, Gemini, Gemini AI. Um, who knows Gemini AI? Okay, Gemini AI is Google's answer to OpenAI's DALI and text-to-image video, so it generates images, and they were uh, attempting, I, I won't speak for them, I have no idea what they were trying to do, but they were trying to address the bias issue in generative AI images, and they generated people of color in Nazi costumes. Yeah. Um, that was February 22nd. Yesterday, Musk came out and started telling people that this is racist against white people. I was like, oh my God. I, I, I don't, I'm not going to get in between their conversation. If you want to understand maybe the business incentives behind their conversation, you can look at New York Times article that was published during the big Sam Altman open AI conversation. They put 70 journalists to understand their story of those five, pretty much five guys controlling this conversation right now, five millionaires. And they go through conversations they had way back at the beginning before these models were, were deployed. Um, but art in the eye, when I say this is one of the most controversial art exhibits of the century or the decade, uh, I think we're really at that X of in the art and AI, art times AI conversation hits politics really, really deep. And I think way deeper than who you vote for, deep at the core of democracy. So thank you for coming here today. I think it's an important conversation and I hope I'm generating a whole bunch of questions in your mind as we speak. So de-biasing AI, has a cost, it's social, it's environmental. Every time you generate an image, it's literally, you know, the equivalent of leaving your fridge open too long. And the com companies who are you deploying generative AI, if you ask JavGPT, what is your environmental cost? It will give you a whole of blah, 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 and no answers. They don't like to talk about the environmental cost that it has. It also puts the burden on the victim. I did a really interesting project with, I've got three, about five minutes left. so. I'm gonna skip that, but it has a cost, so we need to be aware of the cost. Jobs, really important to who wins, who loses in these, uh, in the deployment of generative AI image and video uh, systems. Um, Tyler Perry uh, st stopped, decided not to um, uh, go forward with a production studio, and he said, I'm already using AI in my, in my film studios. It really saves a lot of time on the aging process for our actors and like the makeup and days of makeup, uh, location. We don't need to go on site. We don't need to go to a beach anymore. We don't need, I wanna go and I, I wanna be in, in Banff in Canada. I, I can just generate that. So there are going to be losses. And he said, as a producer, I'm telling you, I, I will have an incentive as a producer to use it. But as a society member, I think this is catastrophic what we're facing. And we need to remember again that these workers, so let's say you're a rail war, rail, I have a hard time with, I'm, I speak French, eh? Rail war, railroad, railroad worker. <laughs> I got it. Um, and that's built. And you need to switch those workers, reskill them, and get these workers to be working on electric cars. Well, that's one thing, you know, as a government, you manage that, you, you give new skills and you move on. You want to reskill all your artists because that relationship between the railroad worker and his railroad and the artist who's painting, you know, her, her childhood, the mother, the painter, the trauma that they lived or and they're telling in their story and their play is they're the people telling our story as a civilization, as a country, as a, as a local <laughs> locality, as a group. It's not the same impact to replace arts and cultural workers. We need to be very, very careful about that. 
yeah, jobs and hold of democracy. So about 30 seconds left. Uh, I touched this already. Maybe I just want to insist that the democracy is facing a global decline. And at the same time, we're also observing increased violence against artists. That, so th again, that junction between art and AI and democracy right now is um, important. And maybe I'll leave you with a question of will AI art facilitate author authoritarianism or digital dictatorships? I'll talk about that in my exhibit. Okay, last <laughs> 20 seconds. Canvas of the future, what is their future? What is the canvas of future? What kind of storytelling platforms of the future do we have? Um, ITU and AI for Good conference uh, in Geneva will be holding, um, they're holding right now their first AI art contest. And it was very interesting to see who's on the judging panel. This is an art contest. I didn't see any artists on the judging panel. Nobody, nobody from the World Intellectual Property Organization is on the judging panel. You have someone from UNESCO on the judging panel, but she um, used to be in um, in a more business environment, to say to say the least. So, the people on the judging board of the AI art contest are not artists, and that conversation on defining what the future of art is is now sneak, slipping into the hands of AI conferences and biz, IEEE, IEEE, it's a business organization that's talking about the future of what art is. We need to keep control or have a discussion on the important role of art. And um, so these, you can just read these on, on the QR code that's on my exhibit when you go see my exhibit, because of course you will. Um, or you can take a picture of this and that will, that QR code actually works. It will bring you to the petition. Um, that was fine here. I'll get out of the picture. Um, or here I'll go in the picture. <laughs> um, these are eight guidelines and best practices that I put forward in my practice as an artist and AI policy worker. Agree, not agree, but it's a great conversation. So March 8th, 2024. Hope to see you there online and uh, that's it. You can take a picture of that. Keep in touch. Okay. Uh, questions? Is that what you're doing? Yep. Okay. Um, let me just ask, you know, the first question, if I might ask. There we go. Um, Valentin, you mentioned briefly this conversation over Gemini and the images it was generating. Um, you've also talked about the importance of kind of debiasing the images, or I should say, you have talked about the um, the phenomenon of AI incorporating bias into the images it generates, and so I would I would imagine also the importance of debiasing and, and, and being sensitive to that. Can you tell our audience a little bit more for those who have not followed this story, what this controversy is with Gemini and what's your take on it? You told us Elon Musk's response. What, what do you think? How does it fit into the whole debiasing topic? No, Elon Musk's comment was yesterday in the news while I was in an airplane. Yeah. And when I read, I, I went to check this morning and I saw the updated conversation on, on that Oh wait, I have to, I'm just going to look at my phone. Do you know how many how much money Google lost because of that? It was funny. No. no, no. Okay. Okay. Google lost 100 billion dollars due to that scandal. Okay? This whole story is important for people who are studying business as as well. And then I went to read the conversation. And I'm like, how could he bring the conversation to it being biased against white men? Mm -hmm. 
there is an entire ecosystem of people in AI who are trying to reduce how bias is presented in AI systems. And I've been working intensely on this art project where I invest myself as an artist. Maybe I can talk now briefly about the project I did with uh, Indigenous, cultural, Indigenous Cultural Organization. And we worked on that debiasing process. And you saw a little bit what I did today as an, as an artist to do it. I literally take my paintbrush or digital paintbrush and I, I change it and then I regenerate it and then it rebiases it or like either erases color or skin or mm, I have another image that you'll see in the exhibit where I put in a little picture of a, a little girl. She looks like she's 12 and it takes her pants off. I mean, like, how can you undress a 12 year old <laughs> in, a, in an image generation? Where, where does that come from? Well, it comes from the available data that it has. It's a lot of anime, probably influenced type of images that are, you know, training. It's the web scraping that they do. We don't know where that data comes from. They're not very transparent on which data they're scraping to uh, train these models. Now, what's interesting is this, there are companies, and that comes along with the kind of work that I do or that Indigenous organization was doing. They were not involved in art at all. What they were trying to do is build an online hate detector to counter all the hate that they, they get as an Indigenous community. It all goes down to data governance. It all goes down to data annotation, data preparation. And it's a very... Um, it's, it's a long process. It's a, it's a cost heavy process to address data quality. Mm. And there's a lot of questions around in legal questions in just that sphere, but it's also business models and economic models and how much incentives these companies have to actually invest in the time that it takes to address that part of the AI value chain. And if I say AI value chain, you know, AI is created through a long process. You have the data collection, data preparation, you can re-annotate, you have to teach the computer what this word is, what this image is. And that whole part of the value chain is really undervalued. There are uh, workers um, who suffer PTSD, who are not, it's like the, um, underpaid, uh, paid $5 a day to annotate data. Some a lot, of, it's very, very hateful and very traumatizing, and it does cause PTSD in, in those workers. So I think that maybe that whole process of these workers annotating the data, the people who are working in AI trying to reduce bias, the people who are working in civil society organizations and art organizations to counter that bias. There's different pockets of the ecosystem that are trying to address these, these issues. So when we look at the scandal, I think for me, what I find frustrating is it's ignoring, ignoring the whole rest of an ecosystem and focusing on Google CEO and Musk having a fight online and the, the media giving too much attention to that. And why, why is that? Right, interesting, thank you. Um, do we have any questions in the room here? Just raise your hand if we do. I see one in the back. I know that moral rights aren't as strong in the U.S. in regards to copyright, but do you think there's an argument to be made that both for the AI company and the artist, once they generate AI, that the art would be, if the AI art is considered a copyrighted work, that it could not be re-fed into the same programs for data creation of other AI, just to prevent uh, degradation? Uh, can you repeat your question, sir? I guess I'll make it quick. Uh, sorry, I'll make it concise. I ramble. Um, I ramble all the time. <laughs> um, in regards to the moral right to prevent um, mutilation or degradation of art in Europe, do you think if AI art is considered copyrightable, 
yep. that AI art cannot be re-fed into the program to I love, okay, I love, now I understand, I love mm. your question. My Selkie, not allowed to go back into their system and I put it in my exhibit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, as it's, a, it's, it's not that I expect them to, to respect that, I guess, because, um, but that's a very good question. When I input my images, let's say my drawing from first, okay, it's graphite, there is no AI, and you look at the user agreements of those platforms, I basically have no more IP over my own graphite drawing the minute I put it into the system for a variation. Um, then if I'm going to use it and integrate it, I, I, I'm going to lose. So we're going to have to about this whole the big pool of art. So even if I contribute to it, I'm trying to de-bias it. I'm trying to do my own art. I make no money out of this really, you know, like, I mean, I don't, I don't sell these paintings. Who, but they are, they're selling their service. So are the user agreements I find extremely unfair and do not favor artists. Uh, if you look at Adobe's user, user agreement, I'm not saying they're angels, but as an artist, I use Adobe, and at least I get something back in return. It's really my more like my tool. They're trying to create business agreements where artists are being are getting something back for for their value. So it's a more even even trade. Um, but that's why I part I, I started this petition because. I find it's a very unfair game right now where I will give my images, my art, uh, and there is no remuneration and no paying for our contributions to training their systems. Does that kind of make sense? So my short answer, because I also ramble, it would be yes. <laughs> so we have two questions for, uh, from online that yep. I'm going to kind of weave together because I think they're each in their own way looking for a positive dimension or adding a positive dimension to the story we're telling mm -hmm. about AI. So one is, it is true that AI can help people learn to code and people to code and improve their code. And so we talked about, you talked about um, how the STEM sector is dominated by men and programming. Um, could AI, by enabling more people to learn to code, enable more women to learn to code and reduce some of that disparity? So I guess that's kind of one question. And then another, maybe teasing out a more positive dimension here. Um, I'll just read it. And as AI-generated art becomes more and more prevalent and high quality, what is the effect on the whole notion of authenticity is it possible that human generated art, music content will actually increase in value and impact over time simply because it is not artificial, with artificial having kind of a negative connotation? So mm. could it have the, the opposite effect of actually creating more value for human, human generated content? Mm. Two excellent questions. So I'll start with the, the first one. Um, I was amongst one of the first people who was very excited and I felt a, bit, a little bit hypocrite about it because, you know, my husband is a coder and he can't draw to save his life. <sighs> so he would love to be able to generate art and I would like to be able to generate code. Um, he's the one who did all the front end for the, the interactive aspects in this website, helped me with uh, training the retrieval, the chatbot basically, the RAG. Um, the interactive map that we have on the website is also uh, thousands of lines of uh, Python code. Um, and I said, like, I want you to use Copilot because I want to see if you have the same interaction as a coder with Copilot as I do when I ask it for policy questions or art questions or legal questions. I have problems because when I ask it for policy questions, the answers of ChatGPT are very biased, pro AI adoption, and says that AI art is art and it doesn't give you the debate option. So he has similar reactions with Copilot, and we know that these technologies are going to improve. You know, this is just a question of, of time. But for now, he has the same kind of reactions. Like, OK, it is mind-blowing and very interesting, but you have to be able to read code to be able to use these tools for now. So as it evolves, I think there is hope. But as a coder, he would say, you do legal policy he says i do code policy mm. and 
you can shape through things through your code. The code is a language. And so there's, I think, yes, there's a lot of potential there, but I wonder if using pre-trained code doesn't give you a pre-trained style and ex expression style at the same way that it does that for me in art and, and mm. policy. Mm. So it's an evolving discussion mm. and I can't wait for I, that to be able to code and, and do interactive features and do text to code for example, draw me up a website, do this. Right. But I do have a lot of friends who are coders and you know, that same conversation around losing your job as sure. a coder applies to them too, right? right. Um, the second question was around the increased value in human created art. I, I think it's an investor from an investor. So if I'm a millionaire and I invest in art, it's an interesting, interesting question for me to, to ask and to, to look at. But if I'm an artist, maybe the 1% of paintings that will increase in value will be great. But as an arts and cultural sector and an ensemble of workers who lose their gigs, we saw it during the pandemic, artists started losing their gigs, cultural workers like sound musicians started losing their gigs. They, they went to work for the government. They went to work on, you know, elsewhere. They never came back. So maybe it'll go up in value, but mm. I find that, kind of, that, that thought is optimistic in the sense that, yes, maybe the 0.5% that paintings that go up to Sotheby's, uh, is that how you pronounce it? I think so. Yeah. Um, will go up in value, but I'm, I'm not sure that's the important question at For stake. current artists, yeah. 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 Interesting, okay, thanks. So um, we are at the end of our time. I see there were one or two other hands here. I think that Valentine will be able to stay for a few minutes if you want to ask her your questions in person. Um, please join me in thanking Valentine for a really <laughs> Thank you. stimulating discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. It's great. So many wide-ranging ideas really stimulating yeah turn our stuff off